Salon. Welcome to our first no due date virtual salon with Pete. How are you all? I see some familiar faces in the crowd. I told you that I was gonna come home for a glass of wine. I've done so, I'm ready to roll. Um, I know that Pete is ready to roll. I'm Amy Willis. A lot of you uh, know me via email. A couple of you even um, know me personally and I'm delighted to see all of you. Thank you so much for coming. This is your time. Uh, so welcome. I think you all know Shelly. Maybe she can give a wave. Um, she helps us coordinate all this. Notably, she mails out your books. Um, so she, she's an important person to know. And we're also joined by my colleague, Laura Getz. Maybe she can give us a wave. Um, she is the director of our publishing program. So she um, bears a great deal of responsibility for the publication of the Buchanan volumes, as well as all of the other Liberty Fund books that we have. Um, this is, we hope, a very casual virtual salon where you get to talk to Pete. Um, I'm going to ask Pete to share a little bit to get us started about how we sort of came up with this whole no due date idea. Um, Pete and I have been having so much fun with this. Uh, I hope that you have too. If you haven't received your February book yet, you should imminently. They have been uh, mailed out. Um, so we'll, we'll turn the chapter uh, in a couple of weeks to Minds Wide Shut. Um, but I'll let Pete give you a little bit of intro about sort of how the, the genesis of this program. Um, this is the first time we've done a program like this, and this is our first virtual salon. Um, we, we did sort of think of this as a way for you to interact with Pete and hear about why he chose this book, why he loves Buchanan, um, ask your questions. We don't have a formal agenda. Um, we have 90 minutes to hang out with you guys, which I'm super excited about. Um, so perhaps in lieu of giving introductions all around because we have such a large group. Um, when you want to just jump into the conversation, use the raise hand function in Zoom and maybe just give a, a quick introduction uh, when you start. Um, we are recording this um, for those folks who aren't able to join us. Um, we even have a competing program of our own right now. Um, so I know there are, are some people who might be in a virtual reading group at the same time. Um, but in any case, as, as I said, I'm Amy. I work for Liberty Fund. Uh, it is my honor and distinct pleasure to be doing this program with my good friend, Pete. Um, Pete and I love to read and talk about books, and we're so happy that all of you have decided to join us and do that, too. I especially appreciate, I see many of you coming in from Europe. I, I would be asleep right now, so um, I'm very impressed that you are here joining us today. So welcome. And Pete, do you want to just, um, like, as I said, give a little overview of sort of how the project came to be since this, this is our first salon, and we'll go from there. Yeah, uh, thank you, Amy. And uh, I agree with you about the enthusiasm of seeing everyone here. Um, in fact, you know, Laura, when I saw her here, one of the things that was so fascinating to me about Buchanan is actually the project of the Buchanan Collect that works. It's 20 volume set. Um, it's an amazing uh, scholarly enterprise that took place over a period of time, um, let alone the output that someone like Buchanan had to be able to make up 20 volumes, you know, just wrap that around your head. Um, but also the uh, effort that was taken place by Liberty Fund and others in order to produce such a beautiful uh, collection. Um, <clears throat> so maybe hopefully we can talk a little bit about that too, if people are interested, the sort of nuts and bolts of putting together volumes like that. But um, the other thing is that Amy asked about this idea. So I actually, you know, Amy might not remember this, but she asked me to recommend for the 100th anniversary of the Russian Revolution, uh, you know, five books on the history of the Russian Revolution. And I decided to give her 25 books uh, rather than five books. I recommended uh, five books in each of the section sessions that, uh, you know, I thought would be able to round out our understanding of it. And so, you know, as academics, as people involved with Liberty Fund, we love books. And our life is about books. And the pandemic actually highlighted our life around books because my friends are my books. <laughs> you know, that's, that's who I had conversations with every day. Uh, and I think, you know, sharing like what books pique our interest. And one of the things that Amy and I used to talk about was what books would be surprising 
to maybe, you know, uh, um, so not only the high quality of books through Liberty Fund, not only the, the books that are being discussed widely among, say, classical liberals, but like what books in our intellectual culture are really catching the, the zeitgeist and, and or our imagination or your imagination. And so, you know, we came, you know, Amy came up with this idea about, you know, trying to uh, highlight a book a month um, and discuss them. And I was just so thrilled to be part of it. And, you know, so it's, it's great. And the selection criteria is a combination of the books that I think um, are extremely valuable out of the Liberty Fund collection. At the same time, what books maybe were valuable to me in my own uh, framing and other books that I think are capturing critical ideas at the moment in time. And so that kind of makes up the set of things that how my brain is working on this. And, and again, I do want to surprise some of you. I'd like to pick a book off the shelf that you haven't heard yet in combination to books that, you, you know, you would feel like you had to know, right? Kind of thing. So, but anyway, I'm really interested to hear your reactions and, and the questions that you would like to ask about Buchanan and, and his ideas and his work. And no question or criticism is out of bounds. It's true. Pete can't pick just one book or five books. I put all the links of his Soviet recommendations in the chat. As I said, it's going to take a few links. So, <laughs> Thank you for managing that for us. But <laughs> yeah. Gotcha. Thanks, Max. Uh, I think that means I'm saying hello. Uh, I, I, Pete really has like a nice Zoom like framing thing set up. You can tell this as well. Like the lines of like the chair and everything. <laughs> you can tell you've got this down. Um, we worked on this, Max. <laughs> yes, yes, I, I, clearly. Yeah. Um, so hi, everyone. Um, my name is Max Golker. Um, I'm an economist for those who don't know me. Um, I, um, this will come out more in our discussion, but I kind of got educated in a very different tradition and sort of ended up with something that didn't maybe work as well for me, although I kind of learned that slowly um, and have been fortunate enough to find maybe um, kind of later on um, some ideas and approaches that do work better. And um, I work I worked in the private sector um, in litigation for a bunch of years after my PhD, and that actually is an interesting perspective too. But um, I work in like the think tank policy research world now, and I'll continue to make it all up as I go along. Um, but I, um, you know, I, one thing is I, I yeah, I've been fortunate to get to know Pete a little bit and, and um, Steve last year as well and a lot of other people and um, been kind of interested. And, and I to me, one one thing that I've really noticed about um, George Mason and Pete is kind of the teaching. And I, I I have to say, I can't help but sometimes feel a little bit ripped off like, hey, why didn't I? And, and so this is like a, just like a little bit of that for me. Uh, and kind of going through some of the material. So I'm I'm very pleased and excited about that. Um, are we going around and, you know, I can, I'm not, the, the, the thing, the educational thing I put on Facebook, I'm going to leave there for now. But I mean, I have stuff I could say, but I also, if we're just going to kind of introduce ourselves, let's all let Amy and Shelley. We don't really have an agenda, Max. I mean, like I said, um, let's let's just have folks jump on in and and either share their thoughts on uh, Buchanan Volume One, ask Pete questions. I mean, uh, really, this is everybody's opportunity to engage with Pete. And I see I see a couple hands. So, uh, Max, do you want to do you want to add something else, and then we'll get to Sabine and Scott? Oh, okay, we lost cool. You. <laughs> Sabine, go ahead. We'll come, we'll come back around. We've got plenty of time. Yep. Hi, everyone. I'm Sabine, and I work at the Institute for Liberal Studies in Canada, in Ottawa, Canada. i um, really enjoying this so far. Thanks so much for doing this. Um, so my favorite essay was, um, let me tell you. So I really, I've, I've read Politics Without Romance before. Uh, I still really love it. I think it's really great. Um, and I, feel, I felt like I understood it better after reading What Should Economists Do? I never really... I, I thought I understood it before, but after I read that, <laughs> it's 
it's like, oh, this so makes so much more sense to me where he's coming from because I agreed with him before, but now I agree with him even more um, on what he's saying in that essay. So I guess my question for Pete that I was thinking about while I was reading this is, uh, how does, I'm not an economist. I did political science and we love to give advice, like policy prescriptions, all we do. <laughs> so I don't understand how, like, it must be so difficult uh, that for an economist to resist the urge to be prescriptors rather than observers, because it seems to me that what um, Buchanan is saying, and from what uh, Pete said at the meeting we had last week uh, with Munger, with Michael Munger, uh, that he, Buchanan thought that economists must cease giving advice. Uh, and I think that's so difficult because you have people like Thaler and Sustine, the, that kind of approach with their nudge book. And that's something that I find very upsetting. <laughs> that, that book, I find it very like, you know, uh, like not what an economist ought to be doing in my opinion. And I think you can, would might agree with me, but I don't know. I'd love to hear Pete's uh, opinion on that. Um, but how do you resist the urge to prescript when you have so much information and you're doing so much observation and to sort of practice the way that Smith did and like that Buchanan did uh, observationally? Um, I mean, <clears throat> one of my favorite stories about Buchanan relates to Dick Wagner so in Wagner's wonderful book, which is on Jim Buchanan and uh, liberal political economy, that's the title of it. It's a great book. I think it's 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 in many ways maybe the as of right now the the best book to have as a secondary source on Buchanan's thinking. But Wagner was a student at the University of Southern California studying political science, and. This is a weird story because he went to a dentist office and in the dentist office, he read uh, the juveniles, the chairman's problem. OK, now, first of all, that's an article published in the American Political Science Review. So why a dentist had the American Political Science Review, I don't know. But anyway, Wagner was waiting and he read this and he became totally enamored with this idea of analyzing you know, what's called the chairman's problem, which is basically a collective action problem, okay? And so then he went and talked to his professor back at USC and they said, oh, you know, the guy who makes the most on collective action things is Jim Buchanan, go and study with Jim Buchanan. So Wagner was a very, very good student. He got into UVA as a, as a fellow to study with Buchanan. He spends the next eight months studying public finance, everything he could find about public finance so he could take Jim Buchanan's class. And he shows up at, in Charlottesville in 1964, and there's a big bill that's being discussed in Washington, D.C. about, like, you know, tax or whatever. And, and uh, Buchanan, the first day of class, says, um, how does an economist view this policy that's being discussed? And Wagner raises his hand because he thinks, like, you know, he's going to impress the great Mr. Buchanan. It, yeah, at that time, the cultural norm was you didn't refer to people as professor or doctor. It was assumed everyone had their doctorate, so you would never call someone a doctor. And it was just Mister. So they, the lane, you know, was Mister Buchanan. He raises his hand. He says Mister Buchanan, and he gives him this whole spiel about what would be the right incentive compatible policy to adopt. And Buchanan responds to him and says, Mister Wagner, we are Democrats here, not tyrants. You have no business offering that solution to the you know the problem and wagner said he went home and he was like wtf like what the hell am i supposed to do you know this is what i thought it was to be an economist and so i think it, the way to think about buchanan is that he's very much a knightian he doesn't believe that any one of us have a red phone to god to tell others how they should live their lives including economists but that also doesn't mean that economists can't actually be informed participants themselves in the democratic process of collective decision making. And his recommendation is that the economists should limit themselves to offering rules, stru structural changes in the rules of the game, and they should offer them as hypotheses to convince their fellow citizens that if they adopted these rules, they would be in Pareto improvements. That means they would generate mutually beneficial improvements in the situation, but they should view the collective action decision-making process as the test of their hypothesis because, and, and he goes at great lengths. Now, you know, 
smart people in this room will realize that Buchanan also is a critic of the democratic process and the biases in the democratic process. So it's it's very important to see the various steps Buchanan tries to go through to make sure that the democratic selection process is unbiased so that it's a true test of your hypothesis, okay? So the first stab at this is in the 1959 article, the positive economics, welfare economics and political economy piece. And what he does in that is he proposes that the existing benefactors of whatever the current status quo is have to be compensated when you change from the status quo so that they would in fact be indifferent. Now to just communicate a funny way to do this, Walter Williams used to tell the funny story about, this is when his wife was still alive and cell phones didn't exist. He said he came home late, really late one night and Connie met him at the door and said, Walter, where the hell have you been? You scared the hell out of me, okay? And Walter's response is, we must have too little insurance because she should have been indifferent between him coming home or not coming home. And that meant that they had to have more insurance so that, right? So, um, so when Buchanan is talking about this compensation scheme, what he wants is a similar thing. You should be indifferent of whether or not you have your monopoly privilege or you've given it up because I've been given this compensation for it. And then after that, you then get the structural rules that would improve the you know, idea. So that's the first bite of that apple. That doesn't go anywhere. So then the second bite of the apple is the veil of ignorance. That's like in the calculus of consent. And then the third bite of the apple is going to be when he writes politics by principle, not interest which is his effort to argue that you sift everything through a generality norm. So no policy can pass that benefits some at the expense of others. The only policies that we can discuss are going to be ones that benefit, if they benefit you, they benefit everyone. Now that, that, that still leaves a, a gaping hole from a libertarian point of view to drive policies through. But just think of how many policies actually get eliminated by putting them through a, a sifting of the generality rule. But that's Buchanan's ways in which he's tried to get this position while, you know, because because Sabine, he's very conscious of the fact that the reason why people get drawn to economics is to try to make the world better. So he wants to capture the zeal of trying to make the world better, but discipline it with the democratic ethos, if that makes any sense. And so it, it, it means that we can't be, you know, uh, rulers over others. And so we're trying to find rules of the game, which allow us to govern with each other rather than to govern over each other. And the standard progressive agenda was one of governing over by rule by experts. And he wanted to pull the experts down a notch, not deny their expertise, but ensure that we ruled with one another in a truly democratic fashion. Democratic fashion here meaning not uh, one man, one vote, but instead democratic ethos, meaning we treat one another as our dignified equals, worthy of respect and stuff. So anyway, I'm going on too long. And this is not meant to be a seminar. It's meant to be a conversation. So I, I, I would love to hear your reactions to that, because obviously there's a lot of tensions in that project as well. Right. I mean, one of the things about authors that I find fascinating in political economy is that the people that I like to talk about, Hayek and Mises and Buchanan and Tulloch and, and all of these people, Adam Smith or whatever, when they have tensions, I see them as pregnant. When the people I don't like, Keynes, Marx, you know, Veblen, whoever, when I see tensions in them, I say, ah, look how balled up they are. <laughs> They're such a mess or whatever, right? But the reality is, is that all th thinkers have various tensions and those tensions can be productive. And we're trying to tease out those things and work with them, I think. And that's one of the reasons why they still speak to us. So, the, you know, to me, what's fascinating about Buchanan or Adam Smith is not the wisdom that they have, but the fact that they still speak to us in how to do social science today. 
And that's what I think is kind of interesting. But anyway, I, Scott, <laughs> and I will be shorter next time because otherwise 90 minutes will go by too fast. You can yeah. see, you guys can see why we needed to invite a lot of friends to, to join Pete in my conversation over the last couple of years, huh? <laughs> uh, that's, that's a tough act to follow. Uh, Scott Johnston from San Diego, California. Pete, I have to tell you, your breadth and depth of knowledge is pretty impressive. Uh, it, it makes me want to ask, have you written some kind of intellectual biography of Buchanan at all or not? I've only written pieces on Buchanan, but he was my teacher. So I yeah. have I have a like an intimate relationship. But also, and, and Laura can talk about this as well. Buchanan had an entire enterprise working for him. All right. He had, you know, first of all, he had Betty Tillman, who was with him throughout his career. So one of the things that's amazing about Buchanan is you have documents from his time at UVA, his time at VPI, and his time at GMU. Very few people, when they move as much as he did, would lose everything, right? Um, and and he didn't because he had Betty there, but then he had Joanne Burgess as well. He had a, a cadre of, of scholars that were working on all these things. Yeah. And so when I was hired to come back to George Mason, so I graduated George Mason in 1988 and then was hired to come back in 1990, 1998, I took over his class because he retired, but he didn't ever really retire. So, and I had to teach the class in his offices at what was called the Buchanan house. And he would show up and, 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 and I had to like be teaching his ideas while he was there, which was, was a very strange experience at times. And students would say, well, what does Professor Buchanan say about this? And he's in the corner and I'm like, you know, like maybe he should answer, but he never like interfered. He would just let me do it. He was just watching it and stuff, but it was very fascinating. He had, he was a, had an amazing work ethic. And I think the difference between him and the other two famous professors that I had, which was Kenneth Bolding and Gordon Tullock was that Bolding and Tullock made it seem like they got hit by lightning bolts from God. And then they would write things. And Buchanan made you believe that as long as you got up at six o'clock in the morning and worked till six o'clock at night, you could replicate what he did. And of course, the reality is, is that you can't because he had an engine working for him. But I think that that uh, those professors really stressed us that um, economics is not just a narrow technical discipline, but a much broader political economy and social philosophy. And so my education in graduate school was a lot different than a lot of other people's education in the same discipline. Uh, Buchanan would always ask you about books that you were reading. He, he advised writing books when everyone else was writing journal articles. So it's different. And then I also had this other fantastic professor, Don Lavoy, who unfortunately passed away very young. But Don was also this very broad ranging scholar and demanded that you pay attention to all the literature and stuff. So, you know, I appreciate your comments, but you know, my, my uh, advice to everyone is be careful who you study with, because that's how you'll teach and be careful who you read, because that's how you're right. And so I was very fortunate to have the people that I studied with. And yes, but just very quick, Scott, there's a book that which captures Buchanan's archives, a sampling of the archives that I did called The Soul of Classical Political Economy with Alain Marciano. And that captures a lot of what you're asking about, the, like what's in the archives and things like that. So go ahead, follow up. But I just ask one quick follow up. I, bad strategy on my part. I, I really like the intellectual content of the essays that were included in the first volume of his collected works. But I, I have to be honest, I had a really hard time with the writing style. And I get that some of it's, the academic world versus popular press. Yeah. But did is that a reflection of his personality as well? Was he? I mean, I I, I kind of would use the like a clinical style, a more formal, yeah. mechanical type of writing. Did that reflect his his own personality? 
So then, he he did he never wrote a book like Milton Friedman wrote. Right. Right. He he only wrote for other academics except for a couple pieces which are in here like you know socialism is dead long live leviathan that's a wall street journal article he 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 did give some speeches politics without romance is a speech but most of the context of his speeches was academic audiences not chicken dinner talks so my undergraduate teacher is a man named hans senholtz and senholtz was a great essayist and lecturer but for audiences that were not academics, he would be invited to places all over the country to talk people that were worried about inflation or he would be making a mint today because, you know, people, people would invite him all over the place. But who he didn't get invited by was, say, the University of Chicago, you know, to give a talk there or whatever. Right. Buchanan, can that's, say, yeah. can that's who Buchanan got invited to talk to. So yeah. he was always talking to other academics. A large part of it was in Europe. So, you know, it, and, 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 you know, the European audiences, but again, you know, at Cambridge or Oxford or the London School of Economics, not exclusively at, you know, Washington DC think tanks. Yeah. So he was writing different for different audiences and he's an analytical thinker. So he is, is, so what you called clinical is very, but he's clear. I would say he's a clear writer, but he is a, a, a clinical writer. Yeah. I, I just want to, I think this is really important. And another piece of what Scott is getting at, I think maybe is that there's a common thread in Buchanan and in people like Hayek where they're talking about a process that um, is hard to capture fully in kind of a cause and effect narrative that people, especially when they're reading kind of for pleasure or in some ways were kind of hardwired to crave a little. And that's hard to deliver with this stuff. Um, and that's really, that's, that's an important um, thing to remember. And I think it, it's why sometimes people will really love Hayek's ideas as they get to know them, but they'll feel at first like he's kind of, you know, sort of spiraling around something and he's kind of, and um, it, it, that's not a problem with an easy answer sometimes. Um, and, and, but that process is exactly what all that math that people are talking about is missing. Um, what it lost there. And that's kind of uh, sort of the crux of, of how we get to different places with this kind of approach. Pete's looking something up there, so. <laughs> I don't know, I was, I was, how about, I, I mean, I think that you can tell the audience that he's writing to because, you know, you'll see that in the middle of, a, of, a, of a, one of his papers, he'll break out very simple geometry. Yeah. So that that's telling you he's talking to other social scientists and often other social scientists of an analytical bent. So what he doesn't do is he doesn't break out complicated geometry. It's like simple geometry and models to Buchanan are a heuristic. They're just simply crutches to help us think about things, even when he does math. So math, he, he was a big advocate of game theory, but most of his game theory is just simple two by two matrix. You know, just to illustrate a point that he's trying to make, he's not, uh, you know, um, he, you know, so any, anyway, I mean, I think that, he, you know, you, you captured something, Scott, which is that he was not, Murray Rothbard rarely got invited to talk to other academics, right? He was invited to talk to politicos, right? Libertarian parties, student groups, things like that. You know, that's not the audience Buchanan was asked to talk to. He was asked to talk at AEI, let's say, in Washington, D.C., which is, you know, you know, other intellectuals or whatever that are that are asking these questions. So it's just a different different audience as a result, different style. Thanks. Let's uh, let's have Jake and Lode hop on in here. And then did I say that right? Um, it's Lord, uh, but it's Lord. basically impossible for anyone who is not Dutch, so don't worry about it. Okay, I'm not Dutch, so I'll, I'll, I'll do the best I can. Let's have you guys hop in and then and then come back to Pete. Good. I, I could jump in. So, yeah, so really, this has been great. Um, I would agree with Scott. I'm, I'm not an academic. I'm, I do work on the private side with an insurance company, but I do provide benefits to government sector. 
So I know all too well about their decision-making process or lack thereof and the difficulties uh, without a profit incentive, um, which has been uh, infuriating at times. But, um, um, but yeah, what Scott said, like the reading was was tough. Like I think it might've took me 40 minutes to like clock five pages at times. And, but upon review, like, okay, I think I get the overall concept and can move on. Uh, but I guess my main question would be, I took economics a long time ago in, in at Ohio State. That's my background. Um, so I'm not completely out of my depth, but it was, it was challenging. I'm a long time listener at Econ Talk. That's how I found this. Um, and I know Russ Roberts is such a big, and it seems like the thread here is about emergence, right? And it seems like spontaneity and the order, and that's such a tar- hard, hard concept to like, I think, to try to explain to people. Like, I would fail at it. I get it, but I would be terrible at communicating it to another person. Um, and it seems to be what Buchanan goes back to a lot for like the different articles. I feel like there's always that thread of what government does versus individuals and always focusing on like the emergent property. Um, but anyway, my question would just be, how, I, if he came back and he was today, like, how is the academic field doing? I'm not in it. You know, I'm not part of it. Would he be like, would Buchanan be like, Oh, we've really lost the battle or is it status quo or is it, you know, improved or like, how do you feel about the current economics um, field? Um, yeah. So my, my question is, is more on the, on the reasons itself. And, and, and Pete also hinted on that earlier. Um, oh, sorry. My name is Loda. I'm from Belgium. Um, I, I'm a philosopher by training, um, currently writing a book on classical liberalism, which is, because there's basically no such book in in Dutch. Uh, So that's why I thought that this might be interesting. Uh, My question, not necessarily to Pete, but maybe to everyone, is that, so Pete earlier said that um, Buchanan always goes from from the status quo, right? Like, and even if we want to improve it from a Pareto optimum point, we should give compensation to those people who would uh, have disadvantages compared to the status quo. But that seems to me like an implicit moral favoritism towards that status quo, a status quo that might be morally, economically, and et cetera, bankrupt, right? Imagine that we we'd, would be required to pay off Kim Jong-il in North Korea in order to improve North Korea. I mean, that's an extreme example, but I mean, there are many such examples uh, in this old, whole industries that exist purely because of or uh, because of subsidies and other protectionism, et cetera, et cetera. I get from a political pragmatic point of view that you want to compensate them to gain their support. But I don't see like from a, I guess, moral economic point of view, why we would, why we, why we would want to do that. If it's purely pragmatic political, fine. But I don't think that's what he's saying. I think he's making a more, in that point, and I, I don't see the arguments uh, for it. Uh, that would be my comment for now. Can I jump in, Amy? This is a, a, a sort of a very important question in applied political economy. So as a youngster, I decided to do my dissertation work on the Soviet Union. So I, I, you know, I, I wrote my first book, which was about the origins of the Soviet Union. And um, I didn't expect it to become all that relevant. But as my dissertation was finishing, the Soviet Union started to crumble or Eastern Europe started to crumble. So I was very fortunate because it meant that my dissertation topic, which five years earlier would have been considered esoteric and five years later would have been oh hum was like all of a sudden the topic de jour when i was in the job market gorbachev was selected as the time man of the year okay so i anyway i was very fortunate and and so then i switched gears after i explained the the origins of the system to how it is that the system was crumbling in a book called Why Perestroika Failed. And I was more Hayekian than Buchanan in writing that book. But here's a dilemma. Just like Doug North says later on, what do you say to a country that needs to have institutional change if your advice is Hayekian? Oh, 
come back in a thousand years after you've grown like a rule of law and traditions and everything like that. And then maybe we might be able to talk. So let me just put this in context since a lot of people are talking about Russ Roberts and Econ Talk. Look up Russ Roberts' Econ Talk with Milton Friedman from 2006 or seven. Uh, it's one of the first ones that Russ is do does. But what's fascinating about it is, is around that time, Friedman um, was always asked about his 1979 trip to China. That's where Friedman came up with the idea of privatized, 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 right? So if you look up anything, Friedman in China. So Friedman's going around, they say, Professor Friedman, how do we fix things? Privatize, privatize, privatize. So fast forward to 2006, 2007, right before Friedman dies, and people are like, Professor Friedman, would you change anything that you said? And he'd say, oh yeah, of course. Privatize, 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 provided you have a rule of law, okay? So the question was, where the hell do you get this rule of law from? And so one way to think about like the rule of law is like what the Ostroms are doing, which is how do you create the common knowledge from the bottom up? That's what's going on in governing the commons. But, or another way to think about it is Buchanan's constitutionalist project. So that forced me to start paying a lot of attention to like what Buchanan was up to in a way that I wasn't even really prepared to do prior to that and thinking about those kind of questions. And when you start thinking about Buchanan and constitutional agendas, right? One of the things that you find right away is this issue of his position of the status quo. And he insisted that he had no moral worth. It just is what it is. The way he used to say it in class all the time is we must begin in the here and now. We can't imagine a start state. We have to begin with the here and now. And in his book, Limits of Liberty, this includes trying to get a constitutional bargain with actors that have disproportionate power. So imagine one group has all the guns and the other group doesn't have the guns. Why is it that the one group doesn't just conquer the other group? How could they ever come to a constitutional bargain with one another? And these are the kind of questions Buchanan is asking himself. So when it comes to the kind of point that you're talking about, you just have to sort of the real politique is that if I don't do the compensation scheme, the interest groups in a transitional gains trap are gonna block. So now's where the simple geometry fits in. If you just do a standard transitional gains trap diagram, which is all it is, is really the monopoly diagram out of Econ 101, and you divide up the boxes, you're gonna, the little triangle is called the Harburger triangle. And the rectangle is called the Tulloch, okay? Now, one of the things you'll notice right away is that the rectangle is bigger than the triangle. So what does this mean? It means that I'm gonna have to pay $25 to pick up a $20 bill. Nobody ever does that, okay? Which means what? That the status quo is just going to continue and continue and continue. So what you have to do is you have to devise strategies that will, in fact, make it be that the $25 it takes to defeat the interest group gets lowered, all right? So the real politic matters for reform. So let's take some comparative historical examples. In the United Kingdom, the abolition of slavery was driven by a compensation scheme to the slave owners. Now, you might say that's morally repugnant, but what didn't happen was a civil war, right? So what happened was that the property rights were shifted. And so as a result, the, the practice went away, all right? And we didn't have to fight a civil war over it. In post-communist Russia, insider deals were struck with the, you know, nomenclatura. So privatization through the nomenclatura, right? Rather than having, and, and again, just like in the slavery example, and just like in the post-communist example, there's always, you know, all kinds of pitfalls. So one of the things that happened in post-communist Russia was the fact that the insider deals ended up by becoming the groundwork for the oligarchs 
because they were able to erect new barriers to entry to protect themselves, right? And so we, we never got rid of the politicization of the economic life in Russia. A premise of the compensation scheme is that you get rid of the political, you never have a new barrier to entry, right? You've already been paid off. So it's like hush money. Like I pay hush money for people to hush. If I if they if I pay them hush money and they keep talking, I haven't I haven't done my job, and that's kind of what happened in post Soviet Russia. Um, and so th th these these schemes work. But the question back to you is, what alternative would you have in a world beyond uh, after public choice that doesn't rely on magical thinking? Like all of a sudden, the existing rent holders are going to say, okay, here's my rents, right? And so. That, that's what's in Buchanan's thought process, if that makes any sense. It's like real politique, no moral worth granted to the status quo. The status quo is just where we are when we start our bargaining. And we have to figure out a way to bargain off of that spot to get to the, the, the Pareto improving change in the rules. I don't know. That's the argument I, I, in a nutshell, I think. Awesome. Let's get Ben and uh, Michael McCovey in there. Uh, well, uh, thanks so much, Pete, uh, you know, for doing this and Amy and Shelly for organizing and everything. Really appreciate it. My name's uh, Ben Peterson. I'm at Abilene Christian University uh, down in Texas, um, and I'm a political theorist trying to learn a little bit of uh, economics and uh, really intrigued by the constitutional economics in particular, kind of that we've been reading about and discussing. Um, the I want to raise kind of, I guess, a two part two part kind of uh, issue or question. It came up in the talk that we had with uh, Mike Munger uh, for a little bit. Um, Pete, I'd love to know what you think about this. His point about um, at least a potential fundamental contradiction with Buchanan's thought, you know, the idea of, um, you know, things, uh, constitutional rules and everything have to be determined based on consent, right? It's the contractarian tradition. But again, sort of the a moral analysis you were just alluding to the kind of you know no supra individual uh nobody has like you said nobody has a red phone to god you can't say what is right reason what is you know really against the sort of social welfare analysis that kind of thing um and yet that fundamental kind of consent requirement seems to be a kind of moral moral restriction right everybody gets to come to the table every, you know uh, equal, e you you framed it earlier in moral terms as well, kind of treating every everyone with equal respect and everything like that. Hey, I just would be curious if you agree with with Dr. Munger on that. Um, second part of my question would be, I, I was very interested to hear that he did some work on like building moral communities and things like that. Um, and it, and I guess it seems like one he's and it, almost he talks about in some places this faith in cooperation, right? The the cooperative capacity of human beings to determine rules together um constitutional rules it, it seems to me like one source of that cooperation might be precisely you know common agreement on supra individual moral norms whether they're religious whether they're just constant hey because this is our constitution you know that we we all believe in it and we have we have beliefs about liberty we have a belief beliefs about um all kinds of moral norms we might believe it so anyway i just was kind of curious what do you think about how you you might think about some of that how buchanan might think of um, some of those questions about morality, where he's insistent on not, at least for the scientist perspective, not bringing in any kind of supra individual norm. Um, and at the same time, it seems like that to me would be a rich source of potential cooperation among, you know, among human beings, which he was so, so uh, uh, interested in. Um, and one last tag on tag, thing to tag on on that is a couple of times Bertrand, Bertrand de Juvenal has come up, you know, as a kind of almost a collaborator in a shared sort of way in a way, not, not a direct collaborator, but a kind of working in some shared space, read each other and stuff like that. And um, he certainly believed in, you know, you know, natural law and th things like this, you know, and argued for it and everything. So those are, those are just kind of the direction I was, I was curious uh, to hear your thoughts on. Michael, I think. Hi. So um, hi everyone. So I'm Michael McCovey. I'm a newly minted, uh, professor uh, at Northwood University in Michigan. Um, a lot of my professors were uh, Pete's students, so I think he's sort of my grand professor. <laughs> uh, um, 
One thing that struck me as uh, very surprising is in the uh, Keynesian Follies uh, essay, if I understand him correctly, he's saying that the Keynesians should have been uh, talking about um, debt monetization, you know, so just, ex you know, expand the money supply to uh, fund their Keynesianism rather than, um, you know, just simple debt financing or taxing because Right, then with you know the debt or uh, taxation you hit either the crowding out or the Ricardian equivalents either you know the government tries to borrow more either tax rates go up and that cancels out the attempt at expansionary policy or people know that their taxes are going to go up in the future so they start saving more money which again cancels out the attempt to expand the economy but he says but you know a monetary expansion can be genuinely uh, surprising to people and ge genuinely unanticipated, so you can actually get the expansionary effect, right? And the monetarists themselves, you know, that's why they say fiscal policy is impotent, but monetary policy can actually have um, an effect. What surprised me is that though he didn't turn around though and point out something that Mises often did, which is that, uh, you know, inflation is a hidden tax. And Mises said, so it's anti-democratic. The whole point of inflationary finance is to get the people, is to fund policies that the people wouldn't have supported if they knew the true cost of those policies. You present them with a tax bill and the people might say, you know, no, I'm not going to pay taxes for that. But you inflate the money supply and the people don't know what they're paying for until it's already done. And so, and like you have, um, I think like, uh, you know, William Hutt and, um, you know, Mises and others would point out that a lot of what Keynesianism reduced to was if labor unions have forced wages above the market clearing level, well, let's fool them. Let's let's cause inflation until the uh, nominal wage equals the real wage and uh, the market will be clearing. So let's just fool the labor unions. Well, eventually the labor unions figured out that's what you were doing. And so they hired economists to include an indexing in their contracts. And so Keynesianism stopped working as soon as the labor unions realized they were attempting to be fooled. So I'm surprised he didn't point out, look, Keynesianism ultimately reduces to this anti-democratic attempt to fool the people if we're committed to, you know, lowercase d democracy, yeah. for lowercase d Democrats, maybe then we should stick to tax financing. Yes, that will lead to crowding out. Yes, that will spoil Keynesianism, but that means it's spoiling the attempt to fool the people. So like, they, you know, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's a, I'm gonna come back to your, your, your very astute observation after I address, you know, the, the question that Ben raised first, if that's okay. Um, so Ben, in this volume, there's a piece on the foundations of normative individualism that uh, you know might be useful to look at. And I also think wrestling with the essay on the relatively absolute absolute makes uh, would would bring up some of the issues that Mike was talking about in Buchanan's own uh, way to wiggle out of difficult spots. So. You know, there's no reason for you guys to know this, but Buchanan uh, graduated from University of Chicago in 1949. And as part of his agreement, he had to go teach back in the South. So he went back and taught first at University of Tennessee. Then he became department chairman at the Florida State University. And then in 1956, he was recruited to become the department chairman of the University of Virginia. And, um, and he was joined there by a fellow classmate from Chicago, G. Warren Nutter. And they founded their center because they had agreed back in 1949, if they ever ended up at the same university, they would create a research center to oppose the current path in which economics was going in. And so I have to address the question Jack raised as well here. Um, which I didn't get a chance to do. But, uh, and they create a center called the Thomas Jefferson Center uh, for Studies in Political Economy and Social Philosophy. And uh, the, the main idea um, was to create a research and graduate education program, which would promote an economist to study in the broader classical political economy tradition rather than in the narrow economics as engineering tradition. 
Okay. And so that meant that you had to talk about the rules of the game and, and all of that. Now that eventually leads to the book, the calculus of consent and Buchanan and Tulloch are pushing forward the idea of unanimity, which is your consent. But they recognize that a pure model of unanimity, what it does is it lowers the costs of political externalities. Right. So the more and more that we have to rely on our agreement means the less and less people can impose on us because the classic Rousseauian puzzle was how can an individual be free while subject to wills other than their own? And since Buchanan rules out that there's such a thing as the general will. Right. It has to be consent that that's the choice. But he also realizes that if I do consent, I can't get any collective action done. Because as I lower the cost of political externalities, I raise the cost of political decision making. Right. So, turn, you know, the group making a decision. And so then he comes up with this idea, basically, of what he calls conceptual unanimity. Now, one of his colleagues at the center was a man named Leland Yeager. And Yeager was a person who was on the spectrum. OK. And so he, he spoke very monotone and everything like that. But whenever he would talk, he would always put quote marks around certain things. And whenever he would talk about Buchanan, he would say, conceptual unanimity means not unanimity. <laughs> you know, like that is a, as a criticism of Buchanan. But Buchanan didn't take it as a criticism. Why? Because of the relatively absolute absolute. Right? That's an example of where he gets out of that. And so I think what you have to do is see him. So in this essay on the foundations of normative individualism, He's denying that he has epistemic individual, epistemic arguments, you know, that, you know, like Mill, like you don't know what I know. And so therefore I should be the best judge of my own character or whatever, or, or my own actions. He says, that's not the reason why we want to have liberty. Right. And so then he has these other ones, but it, it, it's, it's a sort of a very interesting uh, aspect of Buchanan that he has this relative absolute, absolute, which when he is confronted with contradictions, he's able to untie himself out of the knot. And the whole point of the relatively absolute absolute is the claim that everyone has one. It's not just me, it's everyone has it, right? And so I think that's, that's the way to understand that. On Michael's observations, uh, what I would say is that what's fascinating when you read the Keynesian folly is actually how um generous he is to Keynes compared to other writings so one of his main things is to admit that Keynes was a master artist and we're not reading the book in here but I would recommend it to everyone there's a book by a guy named Bernard Yak and it's called The Longing for Total Revolution and it's Cambridge University Press book and what Z what Yak argues is that there's three anti-enlightenment thinkers that have shaped the way we think about the world. And note, I said anti-enlightenment. This is a big issue of it. And those are, you know, uh, Rousseau, Marx, and Nietzsche. And what they do is they paint an aesthetic. They paint a picture. They don't submit their theories to logical or empirical tests. They submit their theories to your aesthetic judgment. Is this a, you know, a good picture of the world or a bad picture of the world? And that's why you can never get rid of the Marxian view or the Rousseauian view by evidence and, ar and, and argument, right? It, it's, it's this picture that they have. And by, in some sense, Buchanan invoking Keynes as an artist, which he does in that essay, he's actually putting Keynes on that same kind of footing, right? Keynes is painting a picture about the Great Depression. People like Friedman and, and Hayek try to argue against him. You know, like Keynes begins the Great Depression with unemployed resources. You know, Michael invoked Hutt. Hutt wrote a famous book called The Theory of Idle Resources where he pointed out, right, that, you know, if you begin in a world of idle resources, you can't explain where the idleness of the resources came from, right? But that doesn't affect Keynesians, you know, or whatever. So, you know, these issues come. So I would point, Michael, to democracy and deficit 
as Buchanan's real analysis of the kind of questions that you're talking about with Keynes and the deterioration of the life political that happens because of the Keynesian apparatus, because the short run solutions to a world of unemployed resources, um, what happens is that it's not a sustainable long run solution, but the politics of it are is that you continue to follow the short run policies as if they're in a sustainable in the long run, and that destroys the body politic and is anti-democratic. It destroys the demo That's why it's democracy and deficit. And I, and I think your point about Mises and the hidden tax of inflation is a very important one. But Buchanan is a little resistant to those analysis of inflation only because I think that he is in this regard a um, uh, and, and this is this is uh, I'm on less sure footing with this, but he is a monetarist and therefore in a lot of ways, it's the price level moving up and price level moving down and their shoe leather costs of inflation, which is different from the relative price effects of inflation. And part of the issue of the intertemporal aspect of inflation is that the first recipients get the money and it's the last recipients that are most hurt by the money when the relative prices adjust through that. And that's a very Austrian understanding of the process of inflation. And Buchanan is in many ways at various times blind to that argument. And so uh, he would miss that point. And I think you're very astute for pointing that out. I, I want to address very quickly, it, it's Jack, I think, asked me a question about the economics profession, right? And Russ Roberts, and I didn't answer your question. I think that, Jack, one of the, the really beautiful things that Russ did was produce a little movie called A Beautiful Loaf which is an update of I pencil and it's just beautiful the way he does it. And he tells his little poem and does all that. Russ Roberts is a master economic communicator. He really is. Now the podcast has become far beyond economics nowadays, but you know, it is heyday. It was more economics and, 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 and that stuff. And it is true that it's all about this emergence and the best paper in Buchanan's idea is the, um, the paper on what should economists do, right? Where he talks about the market is becoming, right? It, it, it's in this process of becoming us as individuals in natural and artifactual man. We, in fact, are becoming, we are emerging. Our utility functions to get technical about it only emerge within the object and the aspects of our choosing behavior. And so Buchanan is very much along these lines with Russ in that. And the question you ask is about, if, if he was still alive today, where would he think we were at in economics? And it's interesting because in many ways, we have more people trying to communicate the core ideas of economics life than ever before, like similar to Russ and influenced by Russ. Sabine edits a, a, a wonderful podcast at, they're called The Curious Task you know, the, the guests that they have on there, the conversation that, that went on, you know, that, did, that didn't happen 25 years ago. But yet at the same time, our economics profession has become more and more impervious to its, uh, I don't know if that's the right word, I think it is, but it have become uh, less attuned to its core principles. And in fact, the core principles are under assault. It's very common to hear people talk about Econ 101 needs to be rejected. And they don't even describe how Econ 101 is actually really taught. And so um, I think we have a harder time. At the same time, we have an easier time. And it's a mess. And I have no idea how to figure it out. But thank God for Russ Roberts and YouTube. Um, but at the same time, you know, it would be really cool if we were had YouTube at MIT and at MIT they were talking about, you know, but even there, I mean, Darren Asimoglu is closer to Buchanan than any thinker at MIT has been in like generations. Right. But also radically different, you know, so it's, it's complicated. It's, it's a very complicated issue. Um, so I'm not, I, that's a, I didn't answer you, but 
I, I think there's, you know, I spend too much of my time worrying about how to fix the economics profession. And I have too little power to be able to fix it. So, <laughs> so it's kind of like a fool's errand. So, yeah. I loved, by the way, when all of you, you were introducing sure yourselves in email, how many Econ Talk fans we had. And I just want to yes. correct Peter and say, the heyday of Econ Talk is not past tense. <laughs> of course, it's. I didn't mean it to be. <laughs> I think it's the greatest. It's, <laughs> it's it's my go-to podcast. It's 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 awesome. I'm kidding. Hopefully, we can get Russ to join us uh, sometime this year too. He thinks this is a. I, we've been talking about um, this the same uh, this same project with no due date. So, um, let's get Philip and Max back in. Hi, Philip. Thank you. Hi there. Good evening from Germany, actually. Um, and I really enjoyed uh, reading Buchanan. For me, it was really a discovery. Um, um, about me, I'm, I'm a fintech entrepreneur in the blockchain space, and I'm a retired partner of a global law firm. It's, when I started with uh, studying law, I started also with the economic analysis of law. So Alkian Dempsey's Coase, um, you know, Akalov um, um, in, in Schelling and the likes were, were a kind of, uh, um, for me, the intellectual heroes. And then I moved into financial economics, and I missed Buchanan. And so, and, and uh, actually now in my early 60s, I start to discover the likes of Hayek and, and Mises and, 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 and so forth. So for me, this is really um, very exciting. Um, I have nonetheless a very simple um, question. It's, it's really a, almost a footnote in economic history, but I'm curious, uh, Pete, because you know uh, all the people around Buchanan and there's a German economist and philosopher, Hartmut Klimt, who is unfortunately quite underrated in Germany, but whom I find quite fascinating. And I, I'm just interested in, in the, in, you know, a very, very quick observation maybe on the intellectual relationship or otherwise um, among Buchanan and Klimt. And, and, and yeah. Keep it really short because he's not the topic of today. So yeah, yeah. But I'm just curious. Uh, 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 let me respond to that, Amy, real quick. I mean, and 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 maybe Laura can talk about this as well. He was one of the editors of the Collected Works. He wrote his doctoral thesis, I believe, on Buchanan and read, sent it to Buchanan. Buchanan was very impressed that he understood what Buchanan was up to as an intellectual exercise, and they became uh, close collaborators and uh, and friends, actually, deep friends, mm -hmm. and uh, and so. Anyway, Laura, if you want to, because she dealt with the editors, yep. Yes, I, I didn't deal with Hartmut in the uh, Buchanan series because uh, that was a little bit before uh, the time I started working on, um, on Buchanan when I came to Liberty Fund. However, I have had frequent conversations with him about, about the series as we have um, been going through other books. And for example, he was... Um, uh, editor for a couple of our Tony Jose books yeah. and um, a couple of other books. So um, I've had some good conversations with him and he had some very uh, enlightening things to say about the whole series and about certain books in general. Yeah. And the other yeah. But the Anthony DeJay's <laughs> books from Liberty Fund, I highly recommend. And he is a, a similar character to yourself, uh, uh, Philip. He, uh, left academia and ideas and, and went into the private sector and then in his 60s returned and wrote a series of books and articles and everything like that. And Buchanan was blown away by the ideas that this guy was working with and and uh, became very close to him. And, and I guess Anthony probably had, you know, a 15 or 20 year period after he was in his late 50s, early 60s, in which he was very active maybe maybe i'm getting the timing wrong a little bit but it's pretty amazing what he did um and liberty fund has his book so mm -hmm. all right i'm i'm sorry that i jumped the gun on everyone i think uh max and then scott and michael are back on the table right i want to have some kind of emoji i can just like some exclamation point i can flash like for half the things you say but um I, I rarely say let's talk about macroeconomics, but I think that 
building on kind of that critique that that he's laying down and you're bringing out of Keynes, he has a sentence in here that was the most striking thing I read for me in this whole thing that for me kind of takes that and and makes it into a critique of the entire field of macroeconomics um, of all disciplines in a way that I think really should be taken more seriously. It's the whole mid-century history of economics and political economy might have been quite substantially different had economists proved more willing to tolerate the simultaneous existence of competing models of reality. Um, and, and, and obviously things can be right and wrong and, and, and all of that, but it seems like macro has particularly loved to stay in these schools that somehow decide that they have to explain everything. And this is kind of a universal, you know, it, and, and perhaps this is just my own preferences as someone who's a microeconomist. But even, you know, when, when I first heard sort of the Austrian theory of the business cycle, I it, said, well, definitely, that seems like a really obvious, like, that's a, uh, seems like a really plausible way to create recessions or make them worse or um, by sort of tinkering with these things without enough information. And I also thought, why does that have to be the only way? And if it doesn't, why does it seem like it's being argued that way by sort of every piece of that discipline? So I think that's been a really, I, I think that's been a problem in these kind of methodological disputes overall is that it's been a little too zero sum. But yeah. I think in macro, it's really particularly been um, been something that didn't that didn't need to be true especially when you know as you obviously everybody appreciates you're we're dealing with such a complicated um topic and and maybe in that sense when 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 buchanan is saying you know keynes is an artist and he's presenting his thing you know and it is keynes is looking it, it, whether keynes knows this or not and let's put that aside at a very unique time and at sort of one specific um, kind of angle. And then he says, you know, Keynesians really made it everything. And, you know, that seems like a problem. And, and it's interesting that it's just, I'll, I'll just, instead of making this like a separate, but I'll just pull in almost the contrast, almost a time when it's the opposite, when it's used in a very synergistic, not zero sum way is when we have this dispute between Buchanan and Arrow's social choice theory, um, which was, I, I, Ken Arrow was still at Stanford when I was there, though he was um, just at the end of being there. Um, but you know, there you have sort of math opening up, um, you know, sort of asking a question in a way that maybe can't be asked exactly without that math. And then you have Buchanan responding in a way that Arrow never could have been able to. And, and it doesn't matter whether Arrow would have agreed with that or not. It seems like there were sort of engaged in a way that's that's that where everybody is sort of, where something emerges out of what everybody brings. And I, I don't know how to replicate that in other places or what's going on there that's different. And I don't, I, um, it's just in uh, kind of a couple of things I wanted to, to put out there really. So I would just say that one of the things we talked about when Mike was here was this uh, notion that Buchanan had of windows that, uh, you know, we look through various different windows. Now, he borrows that idea from Nietzsche, but it was very important to him that it's talking about looking through windows. So, for example, public choice to him was a window to look through. And romance in politics was a window to look through. Or public interest explanations were a window to look from, and what he invited to me, that was is an intellectual Hayek horse and knowledge. By the way, <laughs> I mean, I, it is that's a ve that's a very analogous concept. Yeah, yeah, and, and 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 his idea was is that you run an intellectual horse race between public interest. What does the world look like when I look through the window that way? What does it look like when I look through through private interest group manipulations? You know, what does the world look like? And it, this windows concept is important to him because as much as he wrote uh, uh where's sabine you know as much as he wrote politics without romance later on in life he wrote an essay called the soul of classical liberalism where he argued that we need to reconnect the soul of liberalism you know that we need to be romantic about the free society in some sense where he's a cynic about you know the over expansion of government he needed to be 
romantic about you know the power of spontaneous order right and and so it, it's it it's so so he uses the metaphor window i like to use the metaphor of a prism so i don't know if, you, if any of you remember in the movie um a beautiful mind when the john nash character uh you know proposes to uh you know uh the his his wife um he, you know he, she he they're asking her about like you know what does it mean to love or whatever yes he's like you know propositions or whatever but then what he shows her is a prism and the reason is is because she mentioned at one point about how you know if god was a painter he would have all these different colors right and so he bought her a prism so that when it reflected the light and he twisted it it could get all the colors you know in the spectrum right and so like the way i think about it is that these thinkers like a buchanan a hayek or whatever what they do is they actually twist the prism from the mainstream and then all of a sudden you see different colors than you otherwise would have seen from their point of view because they twisted the prism slightly and what they don't do is they don't throw the the mainstream out the door this is part of the argument that scott was bringing up and others about his writing being dense yeah. his writing is dense because he's writing in a world in which his main avatar what i mean or not wrong word made adversary is paul samuelson <laughs> right and it's analytical economics he's not trying to be milton friedman he's trying to be a better version of paul samuelson and right? when and you that's, combine that's, paul samuelson and ken arrow you get larry summers and then right. run to the hills yeah uh. so so by twisting the prism so that's that's the so i i you know i'm gonna send all of you guys after this talk today um, a PDF of my book on Hayek. Uh, I'll give it to Amy and she can distribute it, you, you know. Um, and <laughs> it's, uh, there's a, on page 54 in there, I have a diagram, a Venn diagram, which talks about what you were just talking about with the Keynesian model. Because the problem is, is that in order for the Keynesian system to work, it, it's a unique case in which you have a conflation of trusting citizens a sincere government and a capable government. And it's only in that intersection that the Keynesian prescriptions would actually work. Any time you find yourself outside of that, so with distrusting citizens, they're going to checkmate the Keynesian policies. With a insincere government, they're not going to do the, the publicly interested move. With a government incapable of knowing how to actually increase the multiplier to get the output figure at the full employment level, they're not going to be able to match it. So it's only in this sweet spot, which is a very, not a general theory. It's a specific theory. Yep. It only holds um, for a specific point in time. I have to give you one more unlikely metaphor and I'll do it quickly. Um, a common value auction, you're bidding on, let's say you're bidding on an oil well. And once we know everything about that oil well, it's really worth the same to everybody, but we've all dug our own drill in. And then you find out as people bid what other people have bid. And you may think you did a better job of drilling. You may not be convinced, but when you see their different drill, you still learn something from it. And your interaction with them, you're arguing with them, even if you're not convincing them of anything, is still teaching you something. Yeah. Pass. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. All right, Scott and Michael. <laughs> uh, I, I think this is a two part question, Pete. And the first one is just if you could say, tell me yes or no. Is natural rights a question about natural rights fair game? Sure. Uh, so where I'm headed is, did, did Buchanan have what you refer to as a window for natural rights? And before you answer that, I, I kind of look at this as like the the philosophical first move or predicate for everything else. And the way I view it is, you know, natural liberty, natural rights, natural law, natural justice, non-aggression principle, property rights, anything voluntary, pri privatize everything, and voluntary charity. That's kind of where I come from. That leads me down a path towards the book that I was mentioning last week with Michael Humer. Yeah. Uh -huh. uh, what was what was Buchanan's 
position on that? Did he have a strong view? Um, look, we're, we're this is this is a very co uh, weird conversation because Buchanan, but so as Frank Knight, and same with Mises, and same with Hayek. They all did not want to put themselves in the box of natural rights thinkers, but they all were very strong normative individualists. OK, and so they're all some weird form of a rule utilitarian. It, 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 right. In, 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 a, in a way. And the reason why Buchanan would give. For, so the reason why Hayek and Mises were against natural rights theory is you have to understand the context in Vienna at the time. The standard argument of the derivation of the Lockean idea was that the right of the worker to the whole of their produce. Natural rights in 1900 Viennese context was an argument for socialism. OK, so it's different from the context that you would have later. Uh, ben is a political philosopher. There's a whole debate about this with Locke and the proviso of the enough and is, you know, and so there's a guy named Ashcraft who in the seventies made arguments that Locke was really a commie. And, you know, then there's Nozick and others who argue that Locke's really like a, you know, an individualist. And, you know, we go back and forth with all these different things or whatever. That's not the debate or the context of the Buchanan, the context of Buchanan, uh, uh, excuse me, of Mises and Hayek is basically the right of the worker to the whole of their produce. And so they're going to counter that with their own form of utilitarianism that's not crude utilitarianism. So it's not act utilitarianism, but it's basically rule consequentialism. Again, Lodi's a philosopher. He, he's forgotten more about this than I'll ever learn. So, again, you, you know, talk to these people. Buchanan thought that people that took the natural rights way were cheating in some level <laughs> so what he meant by intellectually cheating was that um they had their argument kind of uh baked in to the conclusion in the discussions and one of the things that it required was a kind of a um a, a, a confusion i think about what human nature is like so buchanan's version of human nature was that the state of nature is the Hobbesian one of life is nasty, brutish, and short. All right. And so he didn't envision a Lockean state of nature in which we could cooperate in peace with one another, but it just wouldn't be as efficient as, you know, if you had a, a, a government in body. To Buchanan, uh, a, a, the state of nature would collapse into bad anarchy. And the only way in which we can get out of it is not to transform human nature, but to bind human nature with rules that tie the hands of those in authority. And so that's why the constitutional project is the leap out of the jungle, uh, you know, uh, or the leap out of the <coughs> out of this state of nature. And so he's a contractarian. Uh, but again, Hartman Klimt, who was raised before, has wrestled with some of this stuff. So he's tried to talk about the relationship between Buchanan and Kant, for example, and, and, and very creatively examine these things. So I think there's lots of disputes that you would be very interested in looking at, given your interest in like Mike Humer and, and others uh, to look at, because Buchanan is a is a unique social contractarian, right? Um, he's not a, uh, but yeah, that's where, so in the calculus of consent, there's an appendix on the philosophical positions, which are the background to these ideas. And, you know, I would start there, look at that. What is that, uh, Amy? It's volume two, I think, of the collected works is, is the calculus of consent, volume three. I've got it. Yeah, Pete, you need a YouTube channel. Yeah. Thank, thanks very much. It's funny that you say that because a couple of years ago when I was uh, at maybe, you know, 
uh, August Augustine might have been in there or whatever. But when we were having the class, uh, one of my students, Scott King, tried to get me to uh, going into uh, doing this with Patreon because. <laughs> Uh, you know, he was saying that people were making oodles of bucks on Patreon and I should go in there. And I made fun of it because I used to say, what well, you know, these people, I look at them, they put their iPhone on and they start talking or whatever. And I used to make fun of my good friend, Steve Horowitz, who I love dearly. But Steve always used to tell me that he got a million views on YouTube. And I said, Steve, you're the Justin Bieber of Austrian economics. You know, like, you know, you should be getting a big contract here or whatever from that. So I just don't know what YouTube and all that stuff does. But I wish that that, it, uh, you know, that people could have these conversations about these ideas. Yeah. All right. Listen, there is yeah. eight minutes left and Ryan is a new person. But there was someone before uh, Michael had a question and then Ryan. So I'm going to qu be quiet and then Max. So you three talk, but we only have eight minutes left. Okay, so I'll try to keep it super quick. Uh, first, uh, the Fraser Institute has a bunch of new short books about people. Uh, they're free PDFs. So there's one about Buchanan and it's like yeah. 100 pages long and it's got like a 10 page chapter about the calculus of consent. So yeah. probably a super quick way. Uh, yeah. I forget the title it's of that. Reference. Yeah, it's like Fraser Institute's The Great People or something, something like that. Essential Scholars. There we go. Thank you. Yeah. Um, the second thing you reminded, um, I put that Bernard uh, Yak book on my list because that sounds interesting. What that reminded me of, I wonder if you're familiar and if it's similar, is uh, Nicholas Capaldi and uh, Gordon Lloyd's uh, Two Narratives of Political Economy. That uh, yeah. Capaldi was one of my professors. So like, and they have a sequel then, Liberty and Equality in uh, Political Economy. And their basic claim is like they're, they're putting like Marx and Rousseau and other people like that on one side, and they put like Locke and Smith and J.S. Mill on the other, and they say these people have these big, broader narratives that are undergird their ideas. Okay, you know, Marx is not the same as Rousseau, Smith is not the same as Locke, but why are people still talking about Marx? Well, it's because they they have a narrative of like other people are screwing me over and I should take their stuff, or they have a narrative of hey, if we all work together in peace, you know, and we can negotiate with each other and things will work out hunky-dory. And these aren't subject to like empir empirical reputation. Like you can't prove Marx wrong because people are citing him because of the feeling he gives them, not because of any particular thing he said. And same with Locke and Smith. Yeah. Um, Ryan, I guess, or yeah. Yeah, hey, hey, hey. Um Buchanan, regardless of his theme or his subject matter, uh, and across his entire career, he's very, very consistent about two things. Uh, one is his method methodological individualism. You have to think in terms of individuals, not in terms of groups, collectives. And the other is no interpersonal utility comparisons. That's that's a rule of utilitarianism that a lot of utilitarians forget. Um, where did Buchanan get that kind of iron consistency, and what lessons can we learn from that? That's a great question. He describes it as uh, he had a conversion experience studying with Frank Knight. You know, he was, a, you know, a, a country boy who, uh, you know, uh, uh, family misfortune uh, made him have to go to the local teacher's college rather than the Vanderbilt. And at the teacher's college, he, he um you know, took 18 hours a semester and he worked a job uh, on a farm so he could pay all his fees and everything like that. And um, and then he went from there to University of Tennessee, where he did a master's degree um, in economics. And then he went into officer training uh, for the for the Navy. And uh, this is a lot of this is played out in the better than plowing uh, essay in, in, in the beginning. And uh, and then he came. He he had a bad experience in officer training, and he, he became he, he it, that reinforced his dislike for the establishment, uh, you know, and especially the Eastern establishment. And then he got out of uh, the Navy, and he was able to go to University of Chicago for his PhD. And he describes himself as a libertarian socialist when he showed up at Chicago. And then in the spring of 1946, he had Frank Knight. And Frank Knight had this tremendous, 
you know, um, impact on him. And from 46 to 49, he's studying economics, influenced by Frank Knight, but that also meant that he was reading um, various pieces, and you can see this on the syllabus at Chicago at the time, there was no Austrian school. The Austrian school was economics. So Hayek is part of their reading list. Mises is part of their reading list. Uh, you know, Bambavrik is part of the reading list. When Milton Friedman had Viner as his professor, he read more Bambavrik than he read Marshall. Like you just go and look at the syllabus and the number of pages, okay? And so it's hard for people today because they think of the Austrian school as being separate. But in this time, they were just viewed as the people who did good economics. And they were part of the education. And that was very strong methodological individualism. And so when Mises tries to, so when you read high, uh, excuse me, Buchanan's first pieces, the 1949 piece and the early 50s pieces, you can, if you, if you know Mises, you can extract the genealogy of the ideas that are even in there. But those ideas of Mises that are being explored are the same ones that Frank Knight shared with Mises. So Frank Knight shared, if you read Frank Knight's review of Mises' human action, he says that he completely agrees with Mises on all methodological principles. He completely agrees with Mises on all policy issues. He just thinks Mises is wrong in a massive way about capital theory. And that capital theory, and then he spends the whole review complaining about Mises' capital theory. But it, it, the first thing is to say that on the methodology and on the policy, he's in, in broad agreement with them. And that's how they kind of viewed all those things. And so, you know, when Buchanan's in school, the road to serfdom has already been out. When Buchanan is in school, the use of knowledge has already been out. You know, so those are part of the common knowledge of his education. And those are all about methodological individualism, about process, about exchange. I mean, you think about even the what should economists do, right, piece, which is a decade later. But the whole point of that is that I'm studying exchange and the institutions within which exchange takes place. I'm not studying perfect competition models, right? And so he's, it's a very, uh, he gets misplaced a lot of times because we place him in what we thought Chicago economics was circa 1980, not Chicago economics circa 1945, 46, 47. And, and, and so I think he gets it from night. That, that's the long and the short is he gets it from night. So, okay, uh, Max, I think you have the last question and then we got to, okay. So I'm, I'm about running out of light here and, and because it's getting dark here, but I want to tell everyone, we're going to read this book next month. Um, it, it's uh, Mind Wide, Minds Wide Shut. It's a collaboration between a humanities professor and an economics professor. Um, examining the current situation in universities. So it's not economics and it's a broader thing about discourse, basically. So it follows on this same theme that comes out of Buchanan about democracy by discussion. And what are the preconditions for democracy by discussion, not democracy by debate? And I hope that, you know, that's part of the reason why I wanted to lead with Buchanan was because if you, Buchanan is trying to get us to think about economics from the inside out. We are who we study. We are one another's dignified equals. Okay. And we cannot impose our will on any other person. We don't have that, whether or not our expertise or what, none of that gives us that right. So instead, all we can ever do is have consensus, right? And through deliberation. And what would that mean for the way we idealize the intellectual world, right? Is the new fundamentalism dividing us into tribal camps or is it allowing us to have discourse with one another? And so hopefully this book is a little broader. It's written in a way that's for a broader audience rather than just your analytic philosopher doing economics. And if I stay on much longer, I'm gonna lose all my light. So <laughs> the timing was bad because I'd have to get up and move to the other side of the room and I can't move all that quickly at the moment because of injuries that I have. But so thank you very much to everyone. Amy, thank you. Thank I you. I will 
send you my book. Yep, as a, we'll send it out. It's it's called Hi at this book right here. There, this book here. And I'll send you the PDF of it so that you all have it. And and uh hopefully, you know, uh the interactions between Buchanan and Hayek that are in there might interest some of you. So Awesome. Thanks, everybody. If you didn't get your book, Minds Wide Shut, yet, you'll have it, like I said, imminently. They've been mailed out. Um, so uh, it's a it's already I'm loving it. I, I had an earlier one. Right. So it's a it's a front runner for my favorite book of the year, new book of the year. Um, and I it's still January. So that's kind of saying something. And then you can all guess uh, what it's made me read on the side. It's a novel. Um, so it's been it's been a fun adventure. Thank you all for showing up um, and joining us in this conversation.